speaker. Um, and I'm not exactly sure why, um, but uh, maybe maybe it's because when I see her, she calls me boss, um, which uh, she doesn't have to do, but she does anyway. Um, Chris Sakar, so let me talk to you for a minute, Chris, as a boss. Um, the Seventh-day Adventist Church runs 109 Adventist schools in the Pacific Northwest. Did you know that? We have 109 of them, and uh, 19 of those are located right here in western Washington. And uh, I have uh, served on a couple of committees um, with uh, uh, Principal Carr uh, at the at what we call the union level, which uh, facilitates all 109 schools in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I've watched uh, and I've listened uh, to Principal Carr lend a uh, a very educated and critical voice to um, issues of curriculum on curriculum committee and uh, system policy. Uh, and I've really enjoyed serving with you on those committees. Um, I've appreciated the integration uh, of assessment at this school and uh, how assessment is being used to inform curriculum. So can I talk to you for a minute as a parent? Because I, I think that's how I want to talk to you today. Um, I appreciate the curricular advances I've seen at Northwest. I, I appreciate the assessment. I appreciate many of the things I've seen happen. But if you've spent any amount of time in Principal Carr's office just having a meaningful conversation, you'll know what I know. And many of you do know this. Chris Carr's number one goal is the hearts of our kids and leading the hearts of our kids to Jesus. This summer, um, you did something I think is a little bit crazy. Uh, this summer, after spending an entire year with the kids, and don't get me wrong, it, um, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful job, but having had uh, that job for a few years, I can, tell there, I, can, I can tell you quite honestly, and this is, not a, this is not an insult to anybody in the room, all right? Just hear me out. Um, there are days where my nerves were shot. Okay, my nerves were shot. And I would go home and, and my wife would uh, look up and, and, and she would know in the first 10 seconds without me saying anything that I had had a, a pretty rough day. Um, now, Chris, I don't know if it's because I'm your boss, um, but I have never seen that look on your face. You are always as cool as a cucumber. Every time I call you, every time I stop by to see you, um, you know, I, I don't know what's going on in the inside, but the, but the projection is cool as a cucumber, and I've always appreciated that. But this summer, you did something that, um, after spending an entire year at Northwest Christian, leading these kids and shepherding these kids and educating the, the, the children here, um, you chose to put yourself in the middle of 55,000 elementary school students. Now, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, this summer, every five years, our church's um, Pathfinder ministry, uh, and that's a ministry kind of like a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout club uh, for boys and girls, um, every five years, they have what's called a national camporee. And, and, and from all over the world, it's an international camporee, actually, Brad. I, I said national, it's international. From all over the world, kids go to Oshkosh, Wisconsin. <laughs> And they spend the week worshiping and camping and learning and playing. And, and, and there's literally uh, 55,000 of them, 57,000, I think, this year. Wasn't the count? Yeah, Brad's saying, yeah, he's the leader. Um, and, and, and so after spending the entire year with kids and getting ready for another school year with kids, um, Carissa, you, you, you plopped yourself right in the middle of 55,000 kids over the summer. Um, but here's what I appreciate as a parent. We just saw four baptisms here. Amen? Did you enjoy this? Were you blessed? In Oshkosh, there was over a thousand baptisms that week of young people. Every single night, hundreds of students were making the decision for Jesus and deciding to be baptized. And very much to her daddy's surprise and delight, and mommy's, uh, my daughter decided very late in the week that it was her time to be baptized. And, and she stood up and she went forward and um, on, uh, on Sabbath morning, just like this, Saturday morning, um, we got up very, very early and we went and stood in line. And uh, again, there was hundreds of kids making that decision. And um, 
And we processed through, and finally the big moment came, and Daddy had his phone out, and Mommy had his phone out, and and Pastor Natalie, some of you will remember that name from this church, Pastor Natalie, uh, was in the baptismal tank and, and had the honor of baptizing Emma. And then afterwards, we went back, and after all the hugs and the congratulations and everything, um, we went back, and we stood in another really long line to get the certificate. And uh, I don't know, that probably all took 20, 25 minutes. And then, and then it was just, you know, it was all done. And we went back out from behind stage, and the first person that we saw was Principal Carr, waiting there, just waiting for one of her students. And she congratulated Emma and gave her a big hug. And that's what I appreciate about our speaker today, that your heart, first and foremost, is for, the, is for the lives of these kids and to connect them with Jesus. Principal Carr, come on up. Let's give her a big round of applause. Oh, yeah, you don't need that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if I could have one of the deacons move the podium and the rocking chair to the center, I would really appreciate that. I have been blessed this morning, as I know you have. I am proud of um, the ones that I get to teach um, twice a week, the Bells. They have worked very, very hard, but they have all worked very hard, and I am very proud of them. And we have a wonderful school, and you know that, because you choose to put your kids here with us, and we thank you for that, and we are blessed by them. Before I dive into what I want to share with you this morning, I need prayer. So would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, I just ask that you will speak through me today that these are your words for your children and for your people. I thank you for the love that you have shown us, and I thank you for music where we can express ourselves and praise you back for what you have done. In your name, amen. Tell me the story of Jesus. That is the reason why we have our school. That is the reason that the teachers and the staff and I show up every single day. This is what we are called to do. The story of the cross becomes real for people at different times in their life. I grew up in a home where I always knew about God. I always knew him. I believed in him. I grew up hearing stories about him. And it wasn't just because my dad is a pastor, a retired pastor now, but it's because they made it a priority to have that. That's how I grew up. Not everybody grows up that way. But that moment that that story of the cross becomes real is different for everyone. When it became real for me, I was in high school, and we had gone to a Bible camp, some of the leaders in the school, and we were listening to a speaker. He was very entertaining, but it wasn't the speaker that spoke to my heart. It was the story that he told. The description of Jesus' death and resurrection. Realizing that my sins, it's personal now, it's who I am, are forgiven. That moved me. That touched my heart. After that conference, my classmates and I wanted to do something different. We wanted to share what we had learned because it spoke to us. And so we talked with our teachers and we decided that we wanted to use drama and music to share with people in Kansas and Nebraska. And so we traveled to different churches sharing the story of the cross and resurrection put to music. Some people sang, but it was mostly to attract, so it was easy for us to do quickly. Sometimes I played 
the part of Mary, Jesus' mother. I had to put myself in her shoes, even as a young girl, to play that. Through the experience of sharing this story, we connected with it and made it a part of who we were. It influenced us personally and influenced our school. We told our story because it became ours. Jesus asks us to share. If you will turn um, to Mark 5, I'm going to share when Jesus is talking with the demoniac. He had been teaching, and then he calms the storm. He's been busy, and he gets to the shore, starting in verse 1. They went across the lake to the region, and when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs were feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go in them. He gave them permission and they went and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town. They weren't very happy. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion sitting there dressed in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave because they were afraid. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you, how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Go and share. We have been given so much. We are called by God to share our story. So if you'll indulge me a moment. I'm going to use this, though. I'm going to sit down and share a story. My son, Jesus, he fills me with pride and joy. He did so much for others. Did you hear what happened to him? I have to tell what took place if I can get through it without breaking down. You will have to give a mother some patience and understanding while I share this story. You see, Jesus, my son, was in the garden with his disciples. They were just praying in the garden when Judas, he led those high pri- those priests and those teachers, and they tried to arrest him. His disciples, they tried to stand up for him. In fact, one of them went over and cut off someone's ear. But my son, he came and healed it. His compassion for others is so great. 
Jesus said, am I leading a rebellion that you have to come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. They took my son to the high priest where the guards began to mock him, blindfolding him and demanding, prophesy who hit you and beat you. How can you be prepared to ever hear that news? It crushed me when they came and shared it. At dawn, the priests and the teachers brought Jesus before them. If you are the Christ, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I ask you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, are you then the Son of God? He replied, you say that I am. Then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. Then they took him to Pilate. He would have let him go, but the crowd, they wanted Barabbas. The shouting, the anger, the eyes of the crowd, evil was there. They beat him again, this time with a whip. My body hurts when they think when I think of the pain that he endured. My baby who grew up inside of me, my toddler who followed me around the house, my talkative eight-year-old with so many questions. My dependable teenagers who so eagerly wanted to help me. The grown son who took care of me. The man bleeding the crown placed on his head, carrying a cross that almost crushed him. They nailed him to the cross. I looked into his eyes and saw so much love. So much compassion for me. He looked at John. John was having to hold me up. I had tears streaming down my face. And he said, woman, there's your son. And to this disciple, here's your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. He died soon after that. It is finished. His mission was accomplished. He forgave those who put him on the cross, the son of mine, the savior of the world. The story, though, it doesn't end there. After the Sabbath, when the disciples went to the tomb, it was rolled away. He was not inside. The tomb was empty. I was able to see my son again, to say goodbye as he went up to be with his heavenly father. This is my story, watching from my perspective as a mother who has lost her son and whose son rose again but is also the Son of God who came to save the world because he loves each one of us so much. I was called to share that story because it lives in my heart. The song that the students shared... I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. This year I had the privilege of being asked by the third and fourth graders to come in and be interviewed by them. Some of you will also have this privilege, I know. They did a great job, and I was their guinea pig, so I was their very first one. They asked great questions, and I gave them many different answers, and we talked about many different things. In their thank you cards, the thing that they remembered the most was that I liked the color blue that day. But one of the things that I talked about was what I did as a principal. 
So I went through trying to make it concrete for them, but went through a, a long list of different things, many of what nobody ever sees or students never see. As a teacher, you love watching your kids get it or grow and learn. You love it. It energizes you. As a principal, that changes. Because I get to see teachers and staff learn and grow, grow their craft, because it is a craft, it's something that is continually changing, and watching them learn and grow and push themselves in new directions brings me joy. I am warmed by the appreciation that we share as a staff by lifting each other up. And each one of them, I know they're not able to do this without their connection with God. That great connection with God gives them the joy each day. The other big part of what I do is to lead our school team to create a school culture that is focused on who Jesus is and living a life centered on him. Our mission is focused on eternity. We're learning today, but our focus is the future. So everything filters through this, demonstrating to students how to live a life connected to Jesus who saved us. This is why we're here. This is why we see students as individuals. This is why we have high academic standards. This is why we have high test scores and why we take the time to teach core values and cherish and focus on compassion and kindness, to focus on the hope in this world that many see as hopeless. This is why we are a family of friends. We are all called by God to tell the story of Jesus' love. I challenge you to tell your story. I challenge you to share our story. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, I just ask a blessing on our community that you will fill each one and that your glory will be here. We thank you for loving us, for continuing to teach us and to helping us grow to be more like you. Please bless us throughout today in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Carissa. Um, I love my school. I just, I love Carissa. I love the people that I work with. Um, but I have to say, our school would not be the school that it is without the big, strong support that we have from our church family. Thank you, church family. I want to bring up a couple VIPs of our church family. I hope they're okay with me calling them VIPs. Can I have Pastor Mike and Tara come up here? Now I'm getting strange looks. They don't know that they're coming up here. Mike and Tara, can you come up here, please, for just a second? Um... <laughs> You guys are our church VIPs, and they would never want to be called that because they're so incredibly humble. And Tara's shaking her head. No. But they really are the backbone of this church, and they've done such a great... Italian person. Very Italian persons. <laughs> they have done such a great job. Our church, we are still looking for a lead pastor. That's been a process we're going through. And I have to say, has the burden been a little heavier since Seth has left? little bit. I feel like, yeah. <laughs> we are so incredibly grateful for the ministry that both of you bring to the table here at this church. We would not be this church without you guys. And um, I know we had our church re work be recently here. We were cleaning out the sanctuary. Pastor Mike actually crawled into the dumpster to make sure everything got nice and flattened. I don't know if you were picking out some decor for your home or what, but... <laughs> 
He was in the dumpster. Tara was there too. When you come in and, and church every day, Tara's there greeting, asking how you're doing, asking if you need prayer. She is so attentive to the needs that we have in this church. Mike has such a passion for ministry and evangelism and wants to see people coming. And he has this amazing skill to talk to anybody and everybody, no matter what your walk is in in life. He is there. So as a church family, we want to say thank you for all of the stuff that you've been doing for us. Thank you for your ministry and your passion for the work that you've been doing, especially this year. Thank you very much. We have a couple gifts for you guys. And um, this was something that is a gift from our church family to you. We've got a bouquet of flowers. Um, We may or may not have some Italian gift cards in there to some certain restaurants that Tara said you especially like. And one of our members at our church, Robin Caldwell, he would like to detail your car for you too as a special thank you. So if you have been blessed by Pastor Mike, please, and Tara, let's just give them a round of applause. You want to come up and get out to Tara? Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you.